God is speaking to us, and I, I want to jump right in. Can we stand uh, for the reading of the word? Thank you, Jesus. I'm ready. All right, just in case, I need somebody to give me like a basket of amens up here just in case I don't have any. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I, I, I want to I give you a funny story right at the beginning because everything else I say is not funny. All right, so I'll give you this right at, right at the top. Um, this, this has nothing to do with my message whatsoever. I still don't have that gift that Pastor Caleb has to take every life story and, and, and put it into the message, and it makes sense, and it'll be this big aha moment. It's just a story. It has nothing to do with my message whatsoever, but I think... I think um, I think my son Judah has come up with the greatest evangelism strategy known to men. Uh, so uh, last week, uh, my wife called me and she said, hey, Judah, who is our three-year-old son, has something that he wants to tell you. So he gets on the phone and he says, daddy, I prayed and accepted Jesus in my heart. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is the power of mothers, by the way, because my wife is the one who led all five of our children to the Lord. Yeah. So I said, we have to celebrate. And so I went and I got Judah a chocolate cake to celebrate him giving his heart to Jesus. Well, last night we had someone over doing some work and Judah comes up to this person and says, I gave my heart to Jesus and I got a chocolate cake. You should give your heart to Jesus so you can get chocolate cake. <laughs> so now he's telling everybody, if you give your heart to Jesus, you get chocolate cake. <laughs> And that's the greatest evangelism strategy ever. <laughs> so I just thought it had nothing to do with my message whatsoever. I just think it's amazing. We should figure that out, guys, somehow, to have chocolate cake for people when they get saved. <laughs> You'll be like, and you should give your heart to Jesus. And as a bonus, <laughs> on your way out, you'll get a Bible and chocolate cake. <laughs> All right, let's, let's read this scripture together. Um, you got your laughs in. I said, happy Mother's Day. Now we're ready to go. Jude, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude, Jude chapter 1. I will read the first four verses, and then I will skip down to verse 17 and read throughout the end. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Jumping down to verse 17. But you, my friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the spirit, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others. Show mercy to still others uh, 
excuse me, I'm sorry, but do so with great condemnation, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the authority of your word. I thank you for the reality of your word. Lord, I pray that in these next few moments that we have together, that you would give me the anointing, the grace, and the authority to proclaim your word with power in such a way that causes us by the power of your Holy Spirit to see truth. Lord, I thank you that it is not me, it is not my words, my ability or articulation that does anything. It is by your spirit and your spirit alone. And so, Father, I pray that by the spirit you would take these words of mine, translate them and let the, the ears and the hearts of every hearer be transformed because of the power of your word. Let us live different and walk different because of the power of your word. I pray, Lord, that this would not be a seed that is stolen by the enemy uh, or choked by the cares of life, but literally would take root in our hearts, produce a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I pray that the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer and because you are so good so gracious so loving so merciful and so kind would you save people who are in this room who are watching both now and in the future i pray this in jesus name amen everybody say amen, amen. you can be seated i love the place the Holy Spirit has had us in and has led us into uh, and is probably more important than most of us may readily recognize on the surface. Um, a, a few weeks ago, as you know, um, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday and commemorated Resurrection Sunday. But what I want to do in this moment is actually to highlight what has been said uh, in the subsequent weeks after we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, uh, both by Pastor Matt and by Pastor Caleb, because where we are going and where the Holy Spirit is leading us, I believe, is very, very important. And, and this has actually been something that's been stirring uh, in my heart for quite some time some time and I just didn't know if after Pastor Sam I would have the opportunity to come back to this. We'll see what the Holy Spirit does uh, and so um, I have been burdened by the Lord for quite some time. I won't be able to get out the entirety of the burden but I do need to share some things but Pastor Matt uh, said a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, something that I think is important uh, and also I want to highlight something that Pastor Caleb said last week to set the stage for where we are and where we are going. The resurrection of Christ Jesus was the release of power that prior to that moment was never available to mankind. I want to say this again. I recognize that it may not necessarily be readily uh, something that, that we know or can, can jump into right away, but I'm telling you there is power behind this. I'm going to make this statement again because I want you to think about it for a moment. The resurrection of Christ Jesus was the release of power that prior to that moment was never available to mankind. This is important because it is not a momentary power that was reserved for a singular event in time. The power that was released at the resurrection of Christ was not just for the resurrection of Christ as an event. What Pastor Matt said to us a couple of weeks ago, which is why he's the only one saying amen right now, uh, is because it's something that I need us to hear again. He said this statement, and I want us to hear it again. He said, the Father turned on an everlasting flow of power. He said at that moment, the Father turned on an everlasting flow of power. It is not a momentary power limited to a singular event in time, but an everlasting flow of power. 
Now, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But last week, Pastor Caleb gave us uh, his thesis statement for his message, which was rooted in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, which I want to read again. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, uh, it reads this way. You should know this, Timothy, Paul is writing, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure more than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Or as the ESV would say it, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Denying or rejecting the power that could make them godly. This power that we are talking about, according to scripture, is not just a nebulous thing, it is a person. This power is a person. We heard last week in Romans chapter 1, uh, this letter is from Paul at verse 1 to four, verse 4, a slave of Christ Jesus chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. This power is a person. We're going somewhere. This power is a person. And according to Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says this. The Spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. I'm going to say that again. The Spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. In you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Everybody see that? So, the thesis from last week that Pastor Caleb had was this the Holy Spirit lives in us. Therefore, I will either display His fruit or deny His power. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, I will either display his fruit or deny his power. Jesus said to his followers in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's talk about this power. Because we have devalued this power and the irony of the devaluing of the power is that the power has been devalued in the circles that seem to want to elevate it. The, the power of the Holy Spirit has actually been devalued in the charismatic Pentecostal circles which talk the most about power. We got the songs, power, power, Lord, power, power, Lord. We're doing all that, right? And don't want to actually live by his power. Because we have devalued his power. <laughs> if you have ever heard someone teaching about this power and equating the Greek word dunamis to dynamite, your view of power is infinitely small. You know, we're like, the dunamis power, it's like dynamite. No, no, if you are equating it to dynamite, it is infinitely small. 
your view of the power of God is infinitely small. Let's go back to the powerful scripture that Pastor Matt taught us two weeks ago out of Ephesians chapter 1. Um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 in the ESV reads this way. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance and the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to to the working of his great might that he worked in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head of over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all now you are saying okay you're reading all the scriptures you're saying all the stuff let's go back for just a moment remember what pastor matt said to us what i just highlighted again he said a whole bunch to us uh, but i'm just going to highlight this one phrase again the father turn on an everlasting flow of power it is not momentary Paul prays that the Father of glory may give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Pastor Matt so eloquently told us what is that knowledge. It is the knowledge of him, uh, the person of Jesus. He also helped us understand the type of knowing that this passage is talking about, which is the knowing of conscious experience, or as he told us, which is encounter kind of language. And then he began to tell us uh, the things that, that God wanted us to know, the things that Paul was praying that we would understand by the spirit that the eyes of our spirit would be open that we would know what is our eternal hope that we would know what is our position as God's inheritance and three where he spent a, a, a lot of his time which I'm also going to spend a lot of my time was on the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe we're going to focus on that again the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe reading verse 19 through 21 one more time I'm going quickly so you can get to your Mother's Day brunches and lunches and everything else but we're also leaving here with power yes. and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Let me read this. Uh, the scripture is saying to us according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. For some of you who are not used to that language, this language is saying that it is the same power. Pastor Matt brought this out, but I want to bring it out to us again. It is the same power. This power is immeasurable. This power is immeasurable. That's why um, I want to read it to you now uh, in the New Living Translation so that you understand. He says this, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. What is this power? It's the immeasurable greatness that is talking about in the ESV. In other words, family, I'm setting this up for you because once you get this, you will be offended. Yes, I said offended. What is this power? It's immeasurable. It is a power, I know this is obvious, that cannot be measured. You're like, okay, really? Move on beyond the elementary things. Get to the point we got brunch. No, 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 you need to get this. This is a power that cannot be measured. I want to say this one more time. I know it's elementary. I know it's simple, but we apparently don't understand it. This 
is a power that cannot be measured. The power of the Holy Spirit cannot be measured. The power of the Holy Spirit cannot be measured. No instrument or mechanism or equation has ever or will ever be created on earth that can measure the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why I kind of said tongue in cheek, I don't want you to think of or equate this power or the Greek word dunamis to dynamite. That is not only small, but it can be measured. I don't even want you to look at the power of the Holy Spirit as an atomic power or a nuclear power because even that is too small. Why? Because it can be measured in atomic mass units or something called Dalton's. If it can be measured, it's too small. If there is any measurement to anything in the universe, it is too small to compare to the power that is immeasurable, the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit. The power that raised Christ from the dead is an immeasurable power. By definition, it is the full might of the power and glory of God which was present to completely obliterate death, which is the power of sin. Jesus did not just get up that day. He completely obliterated death, which is the power that sin holds. This is one of the reasons why we know that the enemy is defeated. He's not just defeated because he's under our feet because we're seated in Christ and he's under his feet. He's not just defeated because you talk down to him. He's not just defeated because you can cast out a devil in his name. He's not just defeated because the Bible says he's in will be thrown in chains in the utter darkness. No, no, no. He's defeated because he is like a bee without a stinger. All he can do is bother you because death is the sting of sin. Ain't nobody in this room afraid of a fly. You run from a bee or a wasp every once in a while because you're afraid of its sting. What I'm trying to tell you is that the devil is a toothless animal. What I'm trying to tell you is that he's a bee or a wasp without a stinger. Why? Because Jesus completely and totally obliterated the power of death because the same power, the power that showed up in order to raise Jesus from the dead was the full might and the full weight of God and all his glory. God showed up and obliterated death. We don't have the proper terminology, which is why we have to say it is immeasurable. We don't have the proper terminology to talk about it. If I were to try to put it in some sort of picture for you, this would be the picture. But even the picture is too small. Basically what happened was God sent a nuclear bomb to destroy an anthill. You might be like, it's overkill. No, no, no. He obliterated that thing. The Apostle Paul is praying for the believers that God will grant them the ability to understand by the Spirit what can't be understood by logic alone. What God did at the resurrection of Christ, as I've already said twice and Pastor Matt said a couple of weeks ago, was turn on an everlasting flow of power because the scripture tells us, as we already read in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal, mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. What happened? When I started to talk about this immeasurable great power that can't be measured and that God literally obliterated death, it caused some of you to begin to respond and say, yes, thank you, Jesus. But what I also want you to respond to is the fact that that same power 
the full weight of God, that same power, that same resurrection power lives in you. You and I have resurrection power living in us. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So I need you to say something that is literally going to awaken your spirit, not only today, but in the days that come. Somebody say this, there is resurrection power in me. Say it like you mean it. Say, there is resurrection power in me. Say it like you want to convince somebody else. There is resurrection power in me. Say it like you want to convince yourself. There is resurrection power in It is important for us to embrace this reality, to understand how egregious it is for people to teach or live as if believers who are filled with the Spirit are powerless against the temptations of the flesh. Oh, keep that same energy. There is resurrection power. If you believe that the immeasurable greatness of God's power is in you, then you would recognize how egregious it is to ever be taught or to live like you are powerless against the temptation of the flesh or sin. Uh oh. <laughs> it should offend you that this is even a thought in the mind of a believer. You should, now this is going, this is going, just say amen or oh my. You should be offended by the sin that you entertain when you consider the power that is in you. When the devil shows up to tempt you to sin, you ought to be offended. Did you think that I would look at that girl when resurrection... I'm offended that you even presented that to me as if I would turn away from God. <laughs> See, some of y'all don't want to shout right there, but this is a good place to shout because if you're going to shout that resurrection power is in me, then you also ought to shout about the fact that that power that is in me is greater than the power of the world it is greater than the power of the flesh. It is greater than the power of temptation. And it is greater than the power of the devil. <laughs> For it is God, Philippians 2, 13 in the ESV, who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God working in you, giving you the desire and the power, according to the NLT, to do what pleases him. God gives us the will, the desire, and the power to do what pleases him. This power that I am talking about gives us the ability can I sound like an old holiness preacher for a moment? It gives us the power to live right. I'm going to try this side. This power that we have on the inside of us gives us the ability to live right. See, the problem in 2022 in modern churches with lights and stages and sound is we don't want to sound like those old church mothers who would say the Holy Ghost. They didn't call him the Spirit. They said the Holy Ghost will make you walk right. The Holy Ghost will make you talk right. The Holy Ghost will make you live right. The Holy Ghost will make you walk away from some things. The Holy Ghost will make you turn that plate down. The Holy Ghost will make you... We're afraid to sound like that now because we're wondering, does our life look like that? We think that those people are gone. No, no, no. They're here. They're here in this building. 
They're here watching online. There's still a people who will testify. The Holy Ghost, the same people who last week said, thank you, Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. Uh, too many people are praying for the power to do everything else but live right. God, give us the power to heal the sick. God, give us the power to cast out demons. No, 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 no. You're praying for a measure of power when you do that. But when you pray, God, help me to live... You are praying for immeasurable. Woo. We get a little too excited about demonstrating some things. We think that if we have power, when we pray, people will fall out. That's not power. Oh, I'm about to mess with some of y'all. In some atmospheres, that's just learned behavior. I guess if I'm supposed to receive, I have to fall. Just want to let you know, falling down doesn't mean you received anything because when you get back up, you still got to walk this thing out. <laughs> We're so quick, especially in the preacher culture. We're so quick to demonstrate that we have power by who falls out in our meetings. And everybody falling out, and right after the meeting, you in a hotel room with someone who's not your wife. No power. I think somebody put tea in my water. Somebody say, I have resurrection power. We get a little too excited about these external things. You remember in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I understand that it makes for a good Instagram reel that you can cast out devils, but you should be rejoicing over the fact that I'm saved. When's the last time somebody said, I got an Instagram highlight for you. I got an Instagram announcement for you. I'm saved. Yeah. Hallelujah. I just wanted everybody to know that I'm saved. I just wanted everybody to know that I belong to him. I just wanted to let everybody know that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I bet you won't get as many likes as you will with some people fake falling out. <laughs> Jesus is like, don't get overly excited about the ancillary benefits of power. Does no one fall out for real? No, I'm not saying that. I would be denying my entire charismatic Pentecostal upbringing. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that that's not the sign of power. It's just not. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Ooh, okay. The preacher road just had a whole moment. The rest of y'all like, what's going on? <laughs> Rejoice in salvation. Rejoice in salvation. Jesus, in the context and the time of which he was speaking to them at that moment, was saying, don't get overly excited about the ancillary benefits of limited power. <laughs> because what you don't know yet is the power that is coming. What you have right now, 
I need you to hear this. Those 72 that went out and cast out devils and healed the sick in his name had a measure of power. I need you to hear it. What they had was a measure of power. They had a measure of power, but he said what is coming is immeasurable. You got something, but you don't have all of it yet. So don't get too excited about the benefits of having something. Because here's the thing. If you have all of it, that other stuff will happen too. See, here's the thing. We're over here rejoicing because of the measure we got. You're rejoicing over the measure when immeasurable is available? So we're like, look at me. I got power. Do you? Do you live right? (laughs) That's where the amens get a little bit more quiet. (laughs) Friend, the power that is available to you right now is a power that wasn't yet available to those in Luke 10. That's why they were excited. And Jesus was like, don't get excited yet. (laughs) There are people who are spending their prayer time asking for a measure of power. You know what's really crazy? Now, we've reduced it so low, people don't even want to pray for the power to cast out devils or or heal the sick because they struggle with that. They don't even believe it, it exists. And I'm just kind of like, okay, well, just hang out for a little while. It don't just happen in church. <laughs> We've cast out devils in airports and malls and grocery stores. Y'all like, oh, I don't want, I don't, I don't want that at all. The truth of the matter is, some of you didn't even recognize that that's what was happening because of the immeasurable power in you. You, you, you thought that they just went crazy and lost their mind. No, that devil in them couldn't take being around you. <laughs> Stuff just be happening. I mean, me and my wife were dating and... Uh, We were walking past, we were walking to a movie, and we started walking past this person, and literally, they manifested, just start screaming and hollering, God hates us all, hollering and hollering and hollering. You got to understand, when there's immeasurable power in you, these spirits can't take it. And we over here like, God, give me, but but here's how we've lowered it even more. Now you got people who are praying for for fleshly stuff. God, God. Give us the power to sell music and books and move people. See, y'all don't actually think people pray this stuff because you haven't been watching. Oh, it got so quiet. Thank you, Holy Spirit. No, he just stopped me from saying something. <laughs> no. <laughs> Praying for lower stuff, forgetting the reason for power. Why pray for a measure of power when there is immeasurable power available? And it's not just available, it's resident within you and it has a specific purpose. It has a specific purpose purpose. Let me go back. I read it already. Let me read it again for the third time. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Therefore, somebody say, therefore, Therefore. dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now I know 
that the way you want to appropriate that verse in your life is as if you can close your eyes and the Spirit just leads you. I heard him speak today. He said this. I heard him speak today. He said that. The Lord said this to me. God said this. God said that. The leading of the Spirit leads you away from sin. All who are led by the Spirit of God, those are the children of God. What are they led to do? Live righteously. See, that's why I got three claps right there. Because you thought that meant as long as I can hear the voice of God, I'm his child. No, you are his child when you do what he says. Because of the resurrection, we have the power to live right. I wish the church would get excited about that. We celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and now, because we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, which was the Father turning on an everlasting flow of power, because of the resurrection power, we now have the power to live right. I understand, let me say it a little bit louder in my microphone. I recognize that it is not popular today, but it is necessary. Because we have a generation that needs to know that God gave us the power to please him. He gave us the power to live right. We are not going to continue to preach and to sing and to lead worship as if that is not true. The devil is a liar. He gave us the power to live right. Why is the world confused about Jesus? Because the proof of his resurrection is in you. I'm about to show it to you in just a moment. I don't need archaeological evidence to prove it. I don't need, uh, I don't need um, uh, in information to prove it. I don't need any of the. What I actually have is an experience with the Holy Spirit who shows me that Christ's Spirit lives in me and in others. How do I know that Jesus is alive? Because he's working in me. How do I know that Jesus is alive? Because he's working in you I hope <laughs> first Corinthians 15 first Corinthians 15 pastor Matt brought this out I'm bringing it out again first Corinthians 15 verse 12 but tell me this since we preach that Christ rose from the dead why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, you don't have to be late to the brunch buffet. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, you could have a morning tea time. And we apostles, when I say we, I'm talking about Paul when I point, <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> would all be lying about God. For if, for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then all your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, he didn't say if in fact, he said but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who've died. 
Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. What is the way for you to be sure? What is your proof now, 2,000 years later? When Paul was writing, he was in relationship with those who were firsthand witnesses to the resurrection. He was in relationship and aware of the 500 that Jesus appeared to. He knew about Thomas who was saying, let me put my fingers in your nail prints. He knew about James and Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, who could say, this was our brother, and we can also say that he is the Christ. He knew about John. He knew about the Jerusalem church, so he could say that with confidence. How can we say it with confidence? Because the proof of his resurrection is in you. (laughs) There is immeasurable power and that power that we've been given by God is to overcome a life of sin. Sin is not overcome by willpower. I want you to recognize it because every single one of you who have ever said I'm not going to do that again and then did it again can testify that sin is not overcome by willpower but the life of sin is overcome by resurrection power. (laughs) So I've been in Romans 8 a few times. Let's go back to it again. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. How's your thought life? I didn't ask about what you do. How's your thought life? If the next thing you think is about sin, your sinful nature is controlling you. When you are thinking, I didn't just say actively doing so that everybody else thinks that you're. We're not talking about checking the church attendance box. How are your thoughts Monday through Saturday and Sunday afternoon? Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Don't you love the fact that the Word is preaching today? For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in him do not belong to him at all. I think... Actually, I know, but for the sake of being softer, I'll say I think we have a problem. (laughs) I got quiet for a reason. I want you to think about this. We have convinced people that they're saved when they're not. We have everybody thinking that because they said some words one day, but never actually submitted to the Lordship of Christ, never actually allowed the Holy Spirit to control them, they think they're saved. And do you know why they think they're saved? Because you think they are. Because you treat Sinners who don't know him like their brothers. Y'all know why you didn't want to clap? Because you thought that I just stepped into the seat of a judge. And actually what I did is stand on the Bible. You say, wait a minute. They just 
make some mistakes. Are you willing to say, let's go deeper? We'll see. <laughs> Ooh. And remember, y'all don't like this at all. Amen. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives in, within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God, which I've been saying to us over and over, who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. There is immeasurable power in you. That immeasurable power in you ought to be doing something in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The children of God are those who are led by his spirit to do the things that please him. The Spirit of God which raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you. It is the immeasurable power that Ephesians 1 talks about. It is the power that is in work within you, which means that you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature dictates you to do. Those who do not have his Spirit are obligated to do what their sinful nature dictates because they are slaves to sin. Can I offend you? I love when I ask that question. People say, yes. <laughs> the Bible doesn't call it a habit or an addiction. It calls it slavery. <laughs> I understand that you just think, I'm a Christian working through my proclivity of a habit a habitual pattern that I can't seem to get out of and it has a hold of me anytime I want no scripturally that is called being a slave to sin and if you are a slave to sin the question now is is he in you The children of God are free from the power of sin. I didn't say they never stumble. But they are free from the power of sin. Sin does not have a hold of your mind, your body, your mouth, or your actions. And no, no, no. You, you don't, you, I hate it. When preachers stand up here, not here, because we don't let them here. <laughs> and they say, oh, you ain't so super saved that when something happens to you and you stub your toe, you don't cuss. And you ain't so super saved that you ain't never looked at this. And you ain't so, are you kidding me? You are a false teacher. I am not giving my opinion. I'm talking about Jude before I get there. <laughs> Ooh, y'all didn't want to clap for that either. Because you've heard it, and it's some of y'all is y'all favorite preacher. That's why you didn't want to clap. They make me feel good, but do they lead you to Jesus? No, no, no. If we leave here and we're not closer to Jesus than, the time, than when we came and we just feel better, what's the difference between preaching the word of God and a TED talk? You can learn how to be better with a TED talk. But if you want to be free, they have no power. I can tell you where the power is. See, this, this is the kind of thing that will get the other side 
to say that I'm yelling at people preaching legalism. We need to be awakened. We need to be awakened. We need to be awakened because I need you to understand that what we have actually partnered with in our generation is raising up a generation, leading us in worship, prophesying and preaching that does not know God. And we love them. And what we say now is I'm so glad they're so real and relatable. Since when did anybody become the standard by which we relate? It is Jesus and Jesus al alone. My claps are getting less and less. Since we don't want to clap, let me make y'all not clap again. When a fellow brother or sister who claims to be a believer says or insinuates that they can't help it and that they are powerless against the cravings of their flesh, they are telling you they are not saved. <laughs> you don't understand. Some of the people that you call prayer partner are telling you I'm not actually saved. And if through this lens, this would help us to actually lead people the right way. But instead, what we're doing, we got the church or those who identify as a church on a conveyor belt to help. Saying, y'all doing good? Y'all comfortable? We don't want to offend you. We don't want to talk about your lifestyle. We don't want to talk about what you do. Don't worry about it. See y'all on the other side. Okay. Thank you for that one clap. Amen. That may seem harsh to you. It may seem harsh to you. I actually had to wait until the burden, to, the, the burden that I had would either make me say this with tears because I had those. Didn't preach this one without tears. Crying over the state of the, what we call the body of Christ. I've done that with this word. Or make me preach it like I'm angry. This is conviction. Okay, 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 okay. What I just said might seem harsh to you and difficult to hear, but we are not doing any favor to anyone by peddling a cheap salvation that is obtained by mere words. For the kingdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, is not just a lot of talk. It's not just mere words, but it is living by God's power. You didn't like the other stuff I said because you're like, well, no, they are saved, Pastor. You're just being too harsh. You're just being one of those people or whatever. I don't understand why you have carpet. You should just have hardwood planks and, and washboards and tambourines and tell everybody to take off their makeup and wear long white. Maybe we need to do that to remind people. <laughs> That there is a life of holiness. Okay. Let's go Bible. We say let's go deeper. Pastor Hannah would say let's go Bible. All right. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God, and you know that Jesus came to take away your sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. <laughs> but anyone, look at these two words, who keeps on. We're talking about a perpetual lifestyle. Anyone, we, we're not talking about those who stumble. We're not talking about those who make a mistake. That is legalism. There is a difference. What we are talking about is what the Spirit leads us to do. The Spirit leads us into continual righteousness. Righteousness is a state of being and a state of doing. The righteous do righteousness. 
We are made right or righteous by placing our faith in Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. That is the state of being that we are in when we place our faith in Christ. But as a result, he fills us with his spirit, which is immeasurable power, which now leads us into doing righteousness. So righteousness is a state of being and a state of doing, which means that if I'm saved, I live like it (laughs) but anyone who keeps on sinning does not is that up there it's not up there yes okay y'all didn't want to sit y'all didn't want to preach with me y'all like you on your own but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is dear children Don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people, here it is, keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to who? Who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make what? They don't make a practice of sinning because God's life, the Holy Spirit, the immeasurable power is in them. So they... Did y'all, did y'all see that word? Maybe it's offending you. So they what? They can't. You cannot say that his spirit is in you and also say that I still struggle habitually with this thing. They cannot. Because his spirit does not lead you to do that. His spirit leads you to repent. Hold up, get this, to him and to others. No, 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 don't say the spirit of God is in you and you ugly and you nasty and you mean as a rattlesnake and you cuss people out and there's no conviction to go back to them and make it right. It's his spirit in you. Can you lie on people and go to sleep? That means his spirit is not in you. Can you cheat people and sleep well? His spirit is not in you. His Holy Spirit will be like, wake up. I can't let you sleep. You know that person that you spoke to last week? You know that relationship that you messed up? You know that church and that pastor that you dogged down and you left and then you showed up there deeper with your hands lifted but you never made it right? Go back! and repent his spirit does that his spirit does that his spirit does that oh yeah that's how you can lift hands with a a conscience that it's clean because his spirit did that I can lift my hands because ain't nobody got nothing on me there's nobody that can say he did that he said that he treated me this way no 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 my conscience is clear why because his spirit troubles my spirit You want to say, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank him for the troubling. Some of y'all tossing and turning at night. You don't even know. That's God. You trying to take Ambien. No, that's God. Ambien ain't going to let you sleep. The Holy Spirit knows how to get past that. He knows how to get past Benadryl. He knows how to get past Zequil. He knows how to do it. You walking around the whole day. You like, something ain't right. I'm in a daze. I'm in a funk. I don't know what it is. It's because all night, the Holy Spirit has been like, you need to make that right. Now you got a greater revelation. Somebody say, thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) I'm going to just follow the Holy Spirit. There's some of y'all in this room. 
It wasn't that you got to go make it right. It was done to you, and you're holding on. And you got bitterness, and you angry, and you want God to do like some sort of divine assassin. Strike them dead. Let lightning come and hit them. Let the business fall apart. Let the home fall apart. No, that's witchcraft. We don't put curses on people. Forgive them. That's why some of you can't sleep. You holding on to anger and bitterness and you tossing and turning. And if you would literally forgive them as the Holy Spirit wants you to, you'll sleep well. Ain't nobody got to lay hands on you. You ain't got to fall out on the floor. You just need to actually forgive somebody. Pastor, pray for me because I got some situations going on in my life and it's just some stuff going on and people lying on me. They talking about me. They said, I don't need to lay hands on you. I need you to read your Bible. Let the Holy Spirit deal with your heart. <laughs> That's whew, one of the reasons why I actually dislike <laughs> the culture in gospel circles that constantly preaches on haters and the nebulous they. They said I wouldn't make it. They said I wouldn't be here today. They said I'd never be nothing. They said I never. And what did he say? Does it matter what they said if you know what he said? Don't pay attention to the nebulous they when you have. I wish some of you said, he said I'm the head and not the tail. He said I'm above and not beneath. He said I'm the lender and not the borrower. He said I'm strong and not weak. He said, he said, he said, ain't no she said when there's a he said. Uh, but you got to open the book for he said. You got to open the Bible for he said. Because ain't no prophet can tell you everything he said, but his scripture will. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. We're going to live right, mama. We're going to live right, mama. We're going to live right. I got to start landing this plane. Y'all got to go to buffets and brunches and stuff. How did we get here? How did we get here? Y'all ready to shout now? How did we get here? Jude writes this. He says, um, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation which we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago for they have denied our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Jude is like, I wanted to preach a different message on Mother's Day. I wanted us to celebrate the common salvation that we all share. 
I wanted us to leave on a happy note, but now I find that I must urge you to contend or defend the faith that God has entrusted once and for all. And I say this to you because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches. And this has happened, yes, then and now. And saying that God's marvelous grace gives us the ability to live or allows us to live immoral lives. Now, you may say, why are you preaching with such passion and conviction and fervor? Are you angry and upset? No, I am not angry or upset, but I am concerned. And the scripture tells us that we are not to be silent when the true faith is being perverted and polluted. We are not, listen, I understand that we don't like confrontation, but in this matter, the scripture urges us and implores us to be confrontational concerning this. We are not allowed. I'm not going to say supposed to be. I'm literally telling you we are not allowed to be quiet concerning this. When the faith is being perverted and polluted, you don't sit idly by and say, mm, that's a shame. You don't sit idly by and say, man, I hope they get it together. No, 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 that's not what is happening here. What, see, I, what I need us to understand is this. There are brothers and sisters of ours around the world who are literally, right now as I'm preaching, living under the threat of imprisonment and death for the faith. The assault that they are under is called literal persecution. This is important for us Westerners because we are not under persecution. But every time I make a Facebook post, all these liberal woke leftists, they come out the woodworks and they say this and they say that. And I'm being persecuted for the faith in your house with your air condition because on your computer. No, you are not. Did they tell you that because of your posts, we're going to throw you in jail and torture you and kill you and your family? If they didn't do that, you're not under persecution. But we are under assault. The problem is you think the assault is out there. The assault is in here. Oh. There is another assault that is happening right now and it's not a new assault and it's not unique to us or this generation because it has happened throughout all times and that is the assault of false teaching and false teachers. I'm not preaching Jude as if Jude has never happened before. Jude happened because he wrote about it. He was writing to a church where that was happening then. What we are now doing, that is historically true. What we are now doing is saying that same thing has happened throughout all of history and is still happening today. At no point does it go underground. It's always present, which is why every preacher must do what I am doing. And the fact that you think that I'm different by saying this tells you a lot about where we are. <laughs> Uh, David plays so that the moms think that we're going to, to brunch. <laughs> I said yesterday at the home going of our beloved sister Kathy Langley that we've never been accused of going short. But the thing is, I was driving out of my neighborhood. I don't even know if my neighbor is here today. It was kind of funny, but I was driving out of my neighborhood the other day, and, I, and my neighbor came to church on, on Resurrection Sunday, and, and I didn't know if they came to church because we had a lot of people and stuff like that. And so when I was driving out the neighborhood, I saw him, and so, you know, there's a like, hey, you know, hey, man, did you, did you get a chance to go to the service? He was like, man, it was really great. We really, really enjoyed it. Um, is it always that long? And I was like, I felt, I felt like, oh, 
We tried to go shorter on Easter. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, I said, I'll see you later. <laughs> Look at somebody around and say, it's always long, but it's always good. I, I really am finishing, by the way. I have a mother, too. Amen. Believers are being attacked, but not by persecutors or persecution in this state. When I say this state, I'm talking about our state of being, the place where we are, not just Florida, for those of you who understand. They are being attacked by what they have unknowingly allowed in in the form of false doctrine and false teachers. How do we know? How do we know that this is the problem? Why, why address this? Is it because one day I turned on something on YouTube or the television and saw somebody preaching something and therefore it got me all stirred up? Absolutely not. That is not why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching. How do we know this is happening? Because of the fruit of the generation is produced. That's how we know it's happening. We know it's happening not because we are a fly on the wall of every preacher, but because there is a generation emerging that knows not God. Because there is a people who think that holiness is a relic. Because there are people who don't actually live right. And when you confront them, they get angry. They leave. They turn you off. They cut you off. They talk about you. And they go sit somewhere else where the preaching makes them feel good. And if you can live in habitual sin and sit under teaching and not be convicted, it means one of two things. Either the truth is not where you're sitting or he is not in you. The manifestation of false teaching has produced many who are in church but care not about holiness, righteousness, or how they live. And then we hear about it and don't care. What does that say about us? Many of you might say, well, I don't want to be considered someone who judges. Their relationship is between them and God. What is the purpose of community? If I know that someone who is supposed to be a brother is in sin and I say nothing. Don't call yourself my friend if you see me in sin and you say nothing. You're my friend and you're willing to let me go to hell? A whole generation. They want the platform, but not God. They want fame, but not holiness. And whether you know it or not, it is rampant. It's all over the place. And this is not new. The problem is, right now, it's celebrated. We say they're real. It's quite possible. Mm. And some of your favorites don't actually know God. And you think 
I'm wrong by saying it. Let me help you. The scripture is abundantly clear. And we have a bunch of people who are going to church every week. We have a bunch of people who are traveling around the country every week ministering on some of the biggest known platforms in the world who are not saved. And nobody wants to tell them. Is it possible that you could be sitting in Deeper Fellowship Church watching me right now from around the world? And he isn't in you. Because the thing about what Pastor Caleb said to us last week, which was powerful, was that the Holy Spirit lives in you so you will either display him or deny him. Here's the thing about 2 Timothy 3. Are you ready for this? They will have a form of godliness. Or as the New Living Translation says, they will act religious. but deny the power. That's not the power to lay hands on people, Brother Carlton. What they are denying is a power that helps us live right. But they act religious. They have all the right phrases. They got all the right moves. They know how to We're like, oh, God's just working on them. Mm -mm. Is he in them? But let's not talk about them. Is he in you? Is he in you? For the sake of the moms, I'm not going to finish the last part of Jude. But I want to ask a serious question. Because if you are thinking that you're good, I'm good. This ain't the shouting part, right? I'm good. I go to church. I pray once in a while. I have a Bible. I don't read it. But I have a Bible. I'm good. Is it possible that you have entertained voices that have wormed their way into your life, your consciousness? I'm getting all sorts of texts about stuff I need to do. <laughs> and taught you that you can live a life that is immoral. What the word is, I don't have time because I'm going to finish, is lasciviousness. We don't talk about that word anymore. It's not in our common English. You're like, please let us go to lunch. I would give you a number of definitions for lasciviousness or immoral life, but I'm going to give you one the absence of restraint. And people have told you, you can be in church without restraint. You can be saved. Oh. And be living with people that aren't your spouse. You can be saved and regularly having sex outside of the sanctity of marriage. And there's no conviction for that. Is he in you? I know you said a prayer one day. I know you opened up your mouth. You said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. 
I live for you forever. I believe in you. You know what the false teachers believed? They believed in the morality of Jesus, but not his lordship. The problem is, you, we think, I got to stop, I got to stop, I got to stop. We think, we think that we can easily and readily recognize false teaching. But like, honestly, if the devil showed up in horns and a tail and a pitchfork, you would resist him. You'd be like, oh, I know I'm not supposed to do that. That's not how he shows up. So you fall. If a teacher got up here and said, Jesus isn't Lord, he didn't die, he wasn't real, you'd be like, that's heresy. You'd recognize it right away. That's not what they do. They tell you that your life is okay because of grace. They tell you that don't worry about it. I know you sin, I know your lifestyle, but don't worry about it. It's all under the blood. Not for the unrepentant, it's not. Pastor Matt, come take this from me before I... Yeah. Let me give you this last phrase. The immeasurable power of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit in you, gives you the power to live right. If he's in you, you live right. That's how you know. <laughs>